I, I had no shame. And, and my friend said this to me. They said, weren't you ashamed of asking people for money? Mm. And then someone, one of my friends, um, her name's Steph, she's also been in similar posts, but she understands my, my addiction. And she goes, well, you had crackhead confidence. <laughs> because even to fuel the addiction, credit cards, payday loans, overdrafts, unsecured loans, begging, borrowing, stealing, defrauding. I would do anything that I could do to get my hands on money. And by the time someone's even woken up, say six o'clock to get ready for work, I've gambled away a month's worth of wages within that time. There was a particular company I was working for at that time, and they found out that I was Gambling. embezzling or defrauding money from their company. Okay. And because of the status of the company, they couldn't go public with it. Because if they bring bad press to them, it's going to be, well, hold on. That's going to be bad limelight with the staff that we yeah. hire. So for me, I've, <coughs> I haven't got any repercussions <coughs> of my actions. The Jersey Show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Drazzy Show. It's your boy Drazzy. And today I have a very amazing guest with me. He goes by the name of Haj. Haj, Satria Khal, my brother. How are you doing? <laughs> Bro, I'm, a, I'm good, my man. Thank you for having me here. Thank you very much for coming, man. And um, those of you watching, the main reason why Harj is here, because today we're going to be talking about something that affects a lot of people. Some people are too embarrassed to talk about it, but Harj, he's a real guy, he doesn't give a damn. And it's about gambling addiction. And one of the main reasons why I contacted you, you had a video on your social media about the government not doing much to try and prevent people from going down that, that, that dark road. And um, I liked it. And I think I shared it. And you said, thank you very much for sharing it. Yeah. And then we started a conversation from there. And I asked you if you want to come on the show. You said, yes, yeah, so you're here today. So thank you very much for coming, first of all. Uh, thank you. Really for appreciate me, that. Now, Hans, just so the audience can get an understanding of your background, what was it like coming up for you? And how, do you, how did you stray from that path to go down that path of gambling addiction? So growing up, I've, I've born a bread slough. And I've come from a, a traditional Indian household. You know what I mean? So I've always been told to go to school, get an education, go to university. And <laughs> listen, yeah. if you're an Indian watching this, I'm pretty sure it's for the black community as well, man. Doctor, pharmacy, yeah. dentistry, yeah. economics. It's the same. You, you've got to do something that's yeah. going to put you on the map, right? Yeah, yeah. Because in our society, if you're not, if you're not doing something where someone looks at you and go, hold on, he's an accountant, mm. he's a lawyer, or he's a doctor. Yeah. They almost deem me as a failure. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't really have pushy parents, but I felt more pressure from society and the culture. So I went to university. For my sins, I, I studied law and I, I passed law. But it was through university realizing that actually, is law really the progression that I want to go into? And is it the place that I want to be? And I quickly realized it wasn't. So when I left university, I tore my degree up and I went into the world of entrepreneurship. And that was a massive kick for my parents because they're like, hold on, Hodge, man, you've gone to university, you've done a law degree, you can get a good job, a good profession, that's going to set you up for life. Because growing up, I've always been told, look, if you're, if you're earning 30, 40,000 a year, you've got a nice BMW or Audi, you've got a house, you're married you're with children, you're successful yeah. and that's set for life. But was that really what I thought was going to be successful in life? And the truth was my eyes were open to a different reality of life just after I left university. You know what? Everything you said, I can relate 100% because growing up as a Ghanaian is the same. You're looked at as a failure if you're not one of those top three, doctor, lawyer, or, yeah. you know, engineer or something like that. And so was that pressure some of the um, reasons why you probably got into gambling? Was it, did you feel like, oh, okay, I made a mistake, turned up my degree or what am I doing? the gambles and the risks that you took as an entrepreneur, did that pressure put you down that road? How did you get to that road? The, the way I got to that road was when I left uni university, I started a business, right? And it was almost like a Facebook for university students. So what happened was um, one of my investors was a local property person in Birmingham and they lived in a, in a massive house. You know, it's the house that, you know, you think these millionaires, so you, as a kid or growing up, you think, mm. damn, like, that's a house that, you know, you really want to aspire to. Yeah. So I was always around the house, you know, I saw their lifestyle, driving Porsche 911 Turbos, X5s, Jeez. you know, six, six, 640 back mm. in those days. You know, mm. you're talking like 2007. That's massive. You've never been, I've never been exposed to that life. So when I'm now in there, 
with my bit, well, with my investor, yeah. seeing what she's doing, her husband, and you're thinking to yourself, people are living this life. Why can't I? Yeah, yeah. And and the holidays are going on. It was just it was just a different reality. So for me, what happened was about two years of creating that business, I was able to sell it. Mm. And what I realized was I'm now, I think I was roughly about 23 at the time. So I'm like 23 years old at the time. I've got money in the bank. Like I've never thought I'd have money in the bank because yeah. I've always been told, right? Get a job, 30, 40. I've got more money in my bank account than anyone that I've ever thought of in my family has mm. ever had, right? So for me going into going into that world, it was actually on a night out in Birmingham. So my friends were in jobs, working in KFC, working mm. in, in Dixon's. Bloody hell, I'm not sure if they're still around. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're watching this, he's not taking a jab at you, by the no, way. No, 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 <laughs> but it, 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 it was that thing because I was mm. in these, I was with my friends from university. So I was still in Birmingham at the time. So what happened was one of my friends was like on a night out on Broad Street, Birmingham. And he's like, let's carry on the party. Let's go into a casino. I've never been into a casino up until that point. And they're like, the reason we actually went into the casino was because they offered you free drinks and free food. Mm. And so we're like, cool, man. Look, you give me a sandwich, you give me some free food, you give me some more drinks, I'm good. Mm. So it was, it was that very time where it was summer of 2009. Um, where I first walked into that casino. Oh. And I remember that day vividly. Mm. That was the beginning of a very dark road after that, man. Well, actually, it wasn't It wasn't even that. So that was the first stint of it. Okay. What happened is, I've ever been to a casino, if you don't mind asking. No, so, never gambled in my life, man. Well, mm. good. And I hope it stays that way, <laughs> honestly. Inshallah. Yeah, honestly, bro. Yeah. Uh, uh, inshallah, man. Because... Mm. Here's the truth. I remember walking down the steps because when you go in, they ask for your ID, you go through. And I remember walking into the casino and as you walk through these doors and it's really weird, all these casinos like that, you have this front entrance bit and it's almost like this closed door to a, a different world. And as you walk through, I remember going down these steps. As I'm walking down these steps, I can hear people cheering, laughing. I can see all the lights. I can hear the croupiers, the cards, the machines. It's a different world. Like a buzz kind of like... It's almost like, a, it's just a whole different essence. Mm. It's like everyone is there having a great time. Everyone's laughing, joking. And it's almost like this little Vegas style. Mm. So I remember going in and my friends started playing blackjack. And they, un, it literally just went straight down the stairs, then walked straight to blackjack. Wow. And I remember watching them. Hard man, join in the fun. I'm like, I don't have to play. They go, listen, bro, it's good. We got you. You know, we're going to show you how to play. Just put your money in and just follow us. Cool, man. All right. So I put 20 quid in. And I remember exchanging the twenty pound note, and they give you these chips, and um, they're a weird sort of feeling. It's like this this weird sort of plastic feeling, but they're quite heavy. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if you ever played with poker chips. That that no. same thing, right? So I remember them the croupier giving me these these chips, and I remember placing these bets. And I'm, my mates are going, okay, this is a blackjack, this is a double. You have to get to twenty one. Oh, if they stand on seventeen, they're so they're teaching me how this so game works. Prior to that, you'd never gambled before in your life. Never touched it. So you went straight into a casino for your first like taste of that world. That was it. So Jeez. I remember just walking straight in there, and um, so what happened was I put about twenty quid in, and within about 30, 40 minutes, I turned that twenty pound into sixty quid. Now my brain is going, I can make. <laughs> Free, <laughs> free money. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Easy, free, quick mm. money. Because why do I, and, and it was that spark, I think, you know, and, and the essence of, oh man, you're in a cool place. You're having mm. fun. You're enjoying yourself. So is it bloody work? If you, if you can put 20 quid in, get 60 pound out, you know, some people have to work 60 quid for a whole day to make that money. Right. Uh, and that's not knocking them. I'm just saying that's, that's Obviously, what yeah. happens. It's That's the reality. Yeah. And as an entrepreneur, and being an Indian, quick, easy money. Quick, easy money. <laughs> if I can do anything to make quick, easy yeah. money, man, I'm in. Yeah. Sign me up. And what happened was, so that became a regular occurrence. So what happened is we gone a night out and every, say, once every two weeks, um, we'd go out and then go into the casino. And then what happened was it became not just every two weeks, now it became every week. Mm. And this lucky streak for me lasted a lot longer. Normally it's like, first time or a couple of times it almost lost about two three months of you constantly winning 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 yeah yeah so it was but maybe it's because i was doing small bets so when i mean mm. i was winning it, i was 
I was winning back, you know, walking out with 60, 80. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. in that time I was walking out with a hundred pound max. Okay. Uh, maybe that's maybe putting 20 or 30 pound in. Yeah. But still it's free money. Of course. Yeah. Um, so in that time, you know, I was, and I started looking at these professional gamblers that play poker, treating it the proper. Was that on YouTube and stuff? Oh yeah. man, yeah, I was on YouTube back then. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, these guys are doing it as a profession. These guys are making money, but yet they're playing with bigger pots. Yeah. So maybe now I'm enticed to think, well, this could be a business. This could be my life. Yeah. Why do I need to work when I've got money on me? Yeah. Uh, I can use that money to go make more money. But you know what? In You're a Sikh, right? Yeah. In your religion, is gambling a sin? Yeah. So how did you feel as a Sikh knowing that, okay, I was going there weekly, even though you're, you're, you're making a profit, did you feel some kind of like shame, embarrassment, regret, or did you just not care? Um, truth is I didn't care. Okay. And, and the reason why I didn't care is because even drinking in yeah. our religion is seen as sinful. Oh, for real? Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, okay. So, but yeah, if you go to a Sikh party, I'm talking- I was just saying that because one of my one of my colleagues, he's a Sikh and he's yeah. getting married. He's talking about all the alcohol he's buying for his wedding. I'm like, yeah. you're just saying that now. I was like, what? And honestly, you go to, I'm, I'm talking specifically about Sikh weddings. Mm. Um, You go to a Sikh wedding and if you go there and you don't drink, something's wrong with you. Oh, wow. So it's like, oh, yeah, if you go to a Sikh wedding, he's like, yeah, I don't feel like drinking today. They're like, man, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Like and then and then they almost like pressurize you to have a drink. I see, I see. And I think that comes down from generations as well. So growing up, my dad's an alcoholic. Um, that's a whole different topic, mm. and that's part of my therapy. Mm. But you know, a lot of the older generations they wouldn't talk about their problems. So the only way that they would solve their problems is to meet I, together yeah. and drink through their problems. I see, I see, I um, see. So so for me, I saw my dad doing that. And then yeah. I would see my friends when we go to weddings, go to parties. So drinking was a big culture. Mm. And even though we are told from from young, don't do drugs, you shouldn't drink, even eating meat uh, mm. within this, if you're a practicing Sikh, you shouldn't be eating meat. I see. Um, gambling, you know, all these things. Yeah. I think most religions yeah. are like that, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, whether it's the Muslim faith, whether it's the Christianity faith, wherever yeah. it is. I think I think those are basic principles if you're practicing, yeah. right? But I think the reason why I asked you if if, if these are like um, principles within your religion is because with Sikhism and Islam, I find that you're more, you're more it's easy to recognize a Sikh and a Muslim than it is to recognize a Christian. Christians don't have a certain attire. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say? Whereas Muslims, you it's easy to recognize a Muslim if they go if they wear a certain attire or look a certain way. Yeah, with a Sikh even more because. Unless they're not wearing a turban. You know well, what I'm trying to say? Well, it yeah. depends which country you go to. Oh, for real? Yeah, you go to okay. America. They won't tell the difference between if you're a Sikh or a Muslim. Oh, yeah, because Americans are a bit ignorant. If I'm, gonna... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I heard what happened after 9-11. They were attacking Sikhs saying they're Muslims. And it's yeah. like, and they even thought they were Arabs as well. Listen, I've been to America a couple yeah. of times in the past few years. And even still, they don't understand who I am. Wow. So... I was, you know, I was in Australia and I met this, uh, me and my wife went to Australia and we, we met, came across this couple from Houston mm. and they're like, oh, what religion are you? I said, oh, we're Sikh. And they're like, oh, what's that? Muslim? What's that? <laughs> they're like, what's that Muslim? I was like, no, Sikhs. I was like, I was like, are you from, are you from Iraq? I'm like, no, no, I'm just, I'm. Are you from and, Iraq? And I'm, and, it's, and I'm like, yeah. but the thing is, it's maybe because, and this is not locking it, but like I said, when people are so consumed in their own country, yeah. and this is a bit like addiction, when you yeah. become so consumed in your own world yeah you don't care about what it is yeah. I, mean. I lived in america for for a brief time when i was young and i'm not gonna lie everything like you said they are so self-centered in that country yeah like they don't need to go holidays anywhere but in america yeah they don't need to understand anything of other countries unless through their media and you know the same as us we get media from america we get media from all over the world and some parts of the world we get negative images of them some yeah. parts of the world we get positive images so our perception of them is based on our media americans i find that a lot of their perception of the world is through their media yeah i agree and that's why they wouldn't understand because i remember when 9 11 happened i remember there was a news um clip about a sikh man that was murdered yeah. because they thought he was a muslim yeah yeah and they thought he was an arab yeah. even worse and he was like no i'm from india and they're like what are you talking about yeah. you, you're an iraqi and you're from arab or whatever yeah. it is and they just murdered him man. because they saw a turban on him yeah and they thought oh if you've got an association with turban yeah. they're all the same kind yeah so it, it, we we see that right yeah but then i think bringing it back to into yeah. into today look, look where we are right now we're in a, such a multicultural place mm. but the part of that is it's what have we have we been practicing mm. and 
And we've had our parents, our grandparents drilling into us, yeah. be good, be good, don't drink, mm. don't eat meat, don't do this. But because I've been grown up around so much, um, what, what should I say, the wrongdoings of yeah. life, I didn't feel that gambling was any was any different. I see. Because I see. I've never done drugs. Mm. Um, but I've, all, I've, I've drank yeah. loads before. Mm. Uh, I've done, so I've gambled. I've done other things. Yeah. And it's just like, well, that was my life. Yeah. That was my reality. That's my perception of life. So let me ask you this. Let's say, for instance, you walked into a, that casino and there was another Sikh man there. Yeah. Would the two of you have some kind of awkward energy towards each other? Like, oh, you're doing it too? And I'm doing it too? Nah, actually, you wouldn't. For real? Yeah. He would just look at you like, hey, what are you betting on black? <laughs> yeah, because maybe because I think that whole culture of maybe the Sikhs being the Irish of, of the South Asian community. Okay, okay, We're okay. like loud, yeah, brash, yeah, yeah, party yeah. animals. So that fits a Vegas lifestyle. I see, I see, Makes I see, sense. I see. So for us, if I saw another Indian in there, we're like, yeah, yeah. what's going on? You enjoying yeah. yourself? You having a good night? It wouldn't even cross your mind that, oh no. my God, we're gambling. No, no, no. Oh, no. wow, interesting, interesting. So so it's it's really weird, but mm. it's it's maybe when, when I came on to realising that I had a problem, yeah. Then it became a bit more sinister I with see. my own thoughts. So talk me into this. How did you realize you had a problem? Because now, you, you know, we'll go back to where you were. You said you're winning now. It's gone from being fortnightly to weekly. Did it start becoming daily? How did you get down that road of like, oh my God, what am I doing? So what happened was um, I'd go pretty much like once a week. But then when I realized that actually I enjoyed going to the casino, mm. I would go without my friends. So not I'm I'm not going once a week now. I may be going a couple of times a week. Oh wow! And then it was from a couple of times a week. I was going every day, and then I would spend hours in a casino. Like the longest time I've spent in a casino in one sitting is forty hours. Yeah, two days, bro. Did you come up for breaks? Yeah. So I mean, I wasn't just betting the whole forty. Yeah. Hours. I was in the casino. You that go time. home, shower, come back. No, no, no. In the casino for no showering, no coming back in the actual casino for 48 hours. Is that how it works? It's the 24 hours. But I mean, didn't you at some point realize that, hey, I need to go home and I they don't. Because what I was doing, I was up and down. So I'll play some bets. <laughs> then what I was doing, I, you know, I had my own little systems. Cause mm. then what your, my aim became on how then do I cheat the system? How can mm. I beat the game? So then it was a case of, right, I've won a bit. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to have a bit of food. Then and when I get a feeling of actually I've got a good run coming in, then I'll go start again and I'll come back and I've lost money. Hold on. Do I need to take it easy? Mm. What was happening in those 40 hours, I was up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. In the end, when I came out, I was down. Wow. So what was happening was I, I realized that I'm now going every day. And then my friends are saying, no way, you are. I'm like now lying to them. Because mm. I don't want them to go, oh, actually. He's in the casino. He's in the casino again. Mm. And I didn't want them to think bad of me mm. because now if they're thinking bad of me, would they stop talking to me because, oh, he's got a problem. And I think a lot of people fear that sense of feeling left out from earth. Yeah. It's like when we go to school, we always want to be with the it crowd, right? Yeah. Because if we feel that we're left out, we feel that no one's going to be our friends. And I think that's what I try to do. I try to sort of mask it and I'll be like, I'm at home or I'm out and about. But then I realized that actually going into the casino was just a little bit further away. Mm. Then I got introduced to the bookies. So what would happen is oh, fuck. I would I would go into the bookie. So now I'm in the casino. So yeah. listen, I'm at the casino now playing like blackjack mm. or three card poker or backrat or roulette. So the two games I mainly played was roulette and blackjack. But I realized, well, hold on. I can go into bookmakers because then I got introduced to horse racing, um, the greyhounds. Mm. So I could spend my day in a casino, in a bookmaker because it's different mm. because in quite a few of the casinos in America, it's different. When you go to Vegas, they show the horses, they show sports. Oh, so you get all of it in one. Yeah. That's man. why the addiction must be crazy. Over there, oh, there's, it? it's, it's insane. But mm. if you go to most casinos over here, they only want to focus on, on the games there. Yeah. So, I'll go to the bookmakers. I'll do horse bets. I'll do um, football bets. I would do greyhounds. So not so much of football bets. I'll, I would say more of mine was the horses and the greyhounds. But then if I was up, then I'll take that money and I'll go to the casino. Casino, I see. So my day was, I just wanted to spend time betting. So within 20, like I said, 2009, I sold my company. I made a bit of change off the back of that. Mm -hmm. Within a year of of me getting that change from that business, I gambled it all away. How much change you see you lost? It was shy of a hundred grand. On gambling. 
on gambling. So was that was that the red flag for you, or is there still more? There's still more. Jeez, this gambling thing is serious. I'm just getting started because I was like, well, hold on, I'm now I've I've lost all that money, and I remember the day when I went to my flat in Birmingham. I'm like, Shh, shit, mm. I can't do anything now. I've got no money for the phone bill. I've got no money for food. I can't pay my rent. So the only thing that I can do is pack my bags and run back home. And that's what I did. I packed my bags, ran back home and said to my parents, look, I've messed up. I made a few bad decisions, but I never told them about the addiction. Yeah. I never told anyone about the addiction. So but I've always been, I've always been confident in my own abilities. So what happened was I was like, do you know what? I need to go get a job. Right. So I remember applying for back then digital marketing had everything, SEO, mm. PPC, website, email. So I was always good at digital marketing. Right. So I started to, I went to a company and said, let me take care of your digital marketing. They actually paid me 35,000 a year. I became the digital not marketing bad, manager. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. For 2010. Yeah. And for your first time talking to them as well. Yeah. yeah. And I blagged my way. Mm. Right. Um, because one thing you'll, you'll get to understand about people with addictions, especially gambling, they become fucking great bullshitters. Mm. They can lie through their teeth because all they're doing is how can I lie to get money? Mm. And that became a common occurrence through my whole theme. So what happened was I'm now getting paid 35,000 a month. And rather than thinking, do you know what? I can rebuild my life. My thought went to, I'm now earning 35,000 a year. So every month I'm taking home X amount. That X amount can be taken to X amount. And that X amount can be taken to X amount. Because if I've won X amount in a day, then I can not only work, but I can also make more money. So what happened is I used my wages to fuel my addiction. Mm. And so what was happening was I couldn't wait for payday because I would then take the payday, go to work, come back, and I would go, because I was working in Reading, I would go to a casino in Reading, or I'd go to bookmakers in lunch. So any time I could bet, and at that time it was only bookmakers and casinos, that then changed in about 2014, I would say, 2015, where I saw the rise of Vegas in your pocket. Mobile phones. Smartphones. Back then, we, there was, um, we saw the rise, and then I thought to myself, well, hold on. I don't need to waste money and petrol and time going to a casino or a bookmaker when guess what? I can be at work and I can be betting on my desk. But well, didn't it cross your mind that if it's on a digital app, they can they have more control of who wins and who loses, the percentage of those that win and lose? To a certain degree. I think I think as a gambler, you you know that in the back of your mind. But it's the risk. But it's the risk and, and it's almost the case, not you just chasing your losses, mm. you're almost trying to beat the system as well. So mm. it almost becomes it almost becomes more of a driving factor mm. that even though your odds are against you and you know your odds are stacked up against you, you're still willing to put it all on the line and risk it all so that you can beat the system. You know, the human mind is a very flawed organ. And mm. the reason why I say so, there's a movie. Have you seen that movie with Denzel Washington? Um, what's it called again? Um, how can I forget what it's called? It's that movie where he plays a drug dealer from Harlem. American Gangster. American Gangster. Yeah. You see that bit where he goes to Korea and a man says to him, quitting while your head is not the same as quitting when you're down. Mm. And he just didn't listen to the man and he took that last gamble, even though he knew it was the biggest risk and that's what got him done. Yeah. You know, and then he wore the jacket to the yeah. front row, flashy. It reminds me of what you just said when you said, it's like, you know, but you're tr you think you're smarter than the system, and you want to. Yeah. It's it's. I think it's a, a part of our ego and our pride that makes us do things that we know make no sense, but we just want to prove that we can. We yeah. can be the the one to come out, you yeah. know, at the, at the end of the to see the light at the, at the end of the tunnel. And I'm so glad that you touched on that word ego, because why do we have ego in the first place? And when we and when we're trying to use our ego to prove something that's linked to something more deeper. Mm. And I learned this through therapy as well. Okay. And part of that was when I come onto it, it's I was, I was using my ego, fueling my ego for a wrong purpose. So for me, it was a case of, it didn't matter. Like, I mean, when I met, I'm talking about betting and when I mean it consume me, I'll give you a day, an example. I would wake up, right? There was a, I remember the fucking vividly, man. I remember the time when I woke up, I knew that my money would clear into my account. Mm. And by this time now, I'm earning about 45,000 a year. Mm. And I'm thinking, right, that's two, two and a bit thousand. Mm. So I know that money's going to clear into my account roughly about four o'clock in the morning. So I would set my alarm at half four. And I'll set my alarm at half four in the morning. 
because I knew it cleared. And by the time someone's even woken up, say six o'clock to get ready for work, I've gambled away a month's worth of wages within that time. And then you'd go straight to work. Then I'd go straight to work. But I'd always keep maybe a hundred pounds in my account because that'll Just pay for so. my fuel. Yeah. And I remember back then, um, they still do it now. If you go to Tesco's, you can put a pound, no, you pay a pump, you can put a pound in, it takes one pound out of your account uh -huh. and you can fuel it with up to 99 pounds. Okay. And then the rest of the money I'd go, because I thought, hold on, I can't fuel that rest of the amount. So my fuel might be 65 quid yeah. and I buy myself some dinghy. So I'd always put myself in a bit of debt. Mm. So that was, that was my common occurrence. I was always wow. living in, in overdrafts, in debt, yeah. in credit cards, because even to fuel the addiction, credit cards, payday loans, overdrafts, unsecured loans, begging, borrowing, stealing, defrauding. I would do anything that I could do to get my hands on money. And you don't care at what cost. Even if it means you're going to jail, I was willing to do that. For real? Yeah. You didn't You didn't think about the shame you bring onto your family, your community at all? Okay, let me tell you about this true story. So um, there was a particular company I was working for at that time. And they found out that I was Gambling. embezzling or defrauding money from their company. Okay. And because of the status of the company, they couldn't go public with it. Because if they bring bad press to them, it's going to be, well, hold on that's going to be bad limelight with the staff that we yeah. hire. So for me, I've, <coughs> I haven't got any repercussions <coughs> of my actions. So I'm getting away with stuff. So I feel now more invincible than ever before. So it's, it's fueling me to do even more criminal activities. Mm. So this is when I mean, I, I had no shame. And, and my friend said this to me, they said, when you ashamed of asking people for money mm. and then someone, one of my friends, um, her name's Steph, She's also been in similar boats, but she understands my, my addiction. And she goes, well, you had crackhead confidence. <laughs> what, what is crackhead confidence? So have you, have you ever seen a crackhead? And, and they're yeah. always like, bro, they, don't, they have no shame. <laughs> and I mean this with the, with the utmost respect. No, no, they have no, no shame because they, yeah. they would do anything, right? Yeah. To get money or to get that hit. That's called crackhead confidence. Mm. They don't care who you are, <laughs> what you are how you walk in, what you look like, where you're from, your color, your creed, yeah. your race, anything. They see you as a place or a person or something that can fuel their addiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Crackhead confidence. <laughs> I like that, crackhead confidence. <laughs> Shout out to Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Man. So, but this is, this, this is the life of a, an addict. This is the life of someone that's got a, a gambling problem. Yeah. And, and I laugh about this now, but when you're in the depths of this, like, I'm not gonna lie to you, man. I I stole from my parents. I begged from my parents. I stole money from other people. I begged from other people. Yeah. And the truth here is, is that I know that I can say, Drazzy, if you're my friend back then, bro, mm. I'm in a, in a pickle, man. I need some money. Can mm. you sort me out? I'll pay you on payday. I only need like five, 600 quid. Mm. Can you sort me out? You're like, bro, man, what's going on? Can I help you? I'm like, listen, man, I've got it sorted. I've seen a few things. Trust me, man. If I get this sorted, I don't want debt collectors at my door. Mm. Bro, you know, we've gone back a long time. And then you're going to, I make you feel bad about, yeah. about yourself for not giving me money. Yeah. So then you go, okay, cool. I'll give it to you. But in the back of my head, I'm thinking I've got no intention to pay you back. Deep, deep. You know, it's so funny because I had a colleague about a year ago and he was borrowing money from everyone. And when he approached me to borrow from me, I felt like I was the only one who gave him money. Mm. So I thought I was helping. He was like, oh, I've got kids and da, 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 da. I think I spoke to him on WhatsApp about it. I just, yeah. I'm going for a divorce with my first wife, my second wife. I've got kids of her as well. So he's got kids with the first wife, the second wife. So I felt sorry for him. So I gave him a hundred quid. And then I found out later on, he asked this one for 200, that one for 300, that one for a hundred. And there were so many people in the company that were all like clocking that he owed the money. And all the only reason is because he didn't intend to pay anyone back. So one person will complain saying, oh, how should I handle this? And they'll be like, what do you mean? How should you handle it? How should I handle it? He owes me money too. Then it yeah, just yeah. got around that in the whole company that he had borrowed from everyone. So this guy, for that month, he probably made an extra two grand on top of his wage. And it, he got exposed because people went to management to complain as well. And then he done it again. Yeah. Like a few months later. And again, a few months later. Now, it's funny talking to you. I kind of clock now that that must've been some kind of addiction because it makes no sense how... It was a continuous thing like that. And he was always borrowing from everyone and being secretive about it. Yeah. And it's true. And and so what you're saying is stuff that I've done before. Mm. And and it is. So when when you realize that, because it's all a divide and conquer, mm. and then you'll find that 
was it was it some let me ask you a question were these people in different departments different departments there you are yeah they realized well hold on there's one person in this department one mm. person in hr one person in legal one person in sales mm. one person in customer so what you then do is you're dividing conquering mm. and like you said if i got 50 pound from this person or 100 pound from this person through 10 people that's between 500 to 1000 pound that can fuel your addiction wow and um and what people don't understand is that it doesn't matter what addiction you have when you're at the very depths of it, and this is where I was at, like for me, the depths of it was anything that I can do to get access to money at no matter what cost, I was a Tasmanian devil for relationships. As long as I made, if I made you feel bad for not yeah. giving me money, if I did anything that I could do to coerce you or tell you lies or make you feel in a certain way that you owe it to me mm. to give me money, then I'm doing a good job as a gambling addict. Wow. And it's and it's harsh that I say this now, but I'm just speaking the truth. No, no bro, I respect your honesty, bro. I respect your honesty because, bro, look, that is what vices are. Vices take you down roads that you do things that, in all honesty, you're not going to be proud of. Yeah. And other people might shame you for it. So we try and hide, but these things are real. Yeah, man. They're real, you know? And look, if I give you, I was sort of talking about my daily uh, way of when I was gambling. So if you looked at my day gambling, I'd wake up, gamble. I'd be on the way to work. And when you're on casinos, you can do auto spins on roulette. So you're in the car driving and you're watching, and you're almost <laughs> watching these auto spins. Then you get to work. Like, you have your Monday morning meeting. Or yeah. You have a morning meeting. You're like, cool. Can I go now? Wicked. Mm. Then I'll go, someone would have thought I had IBS. Yeah. Amount of time I was in the toilet, at work, at home, gambling, you'd think this person got a problem. Yeah. Right? I mean, I'll, I would even book myself meeting rooms so I can go gamble in there, but I'm just, I'll pretend I'll like in a meeting. Yeah. Because yeah, I've got now a meeting room booked to myself for an hour yeah. so I can just gamble for an hour. At work, during lunchtime, I'll go gamble. Through break time, I'll gamble. I even lied to my wife or my partner back then to say, look, there's so much work on, I've got to stay behind so I can gamble. Mm. I'll, or I'll go to a bookie or I wouldn't go to casinos because casinos are too far. Mm. Um, but for me, it was, and when I got back home, had it to my wife and then I'd go, right, cool, I need to go to the toilet. I'd spend like half an hour, 45 minutes in the toilet. Oh. And for men, that's our office sometimes. Yeah. That's our peace. Yeah. That's where we yeah. can just switch off from everyone, right? But for me, it was a place where I can go and gamble more. Damn. I mean, you, sorry, and sorry, I, sorry, and yeah. I remember I'd be next to my wife in bed while she's sleeping, Ooh. gambling. So the truth is, when I mean gambling consumed my life, it was consuming every, I would say every minute of my life. Wow, wow, wow. You said earlier your partner back then, did you lose your first wife to gambling? No. So, um, so I say my partner because obviously she was my girlfriend. Okay, I see, yeah. okay. And the truth, I'm talking about that. I met my wife uh, on a flight back from New York. I'm sorry, I thought you were going to say you met your wife in the casino. <laughs> <laughs> nah, could you imagine that? That would be a story. Uh, but in a, she actually... She gave me the chips and I said, you look good. <laughs> well, it's not far off, man, because I'll tell you why, because I was coming back from Vegas. Mm. So I was, I was going to Vegas for a mate stag and on the way back, I had a stopover flight in New York. And that's when I met my wife on a flight back from New York. So I guess there's a positive out of the negative. Yeah, then. <laughs> I would say love is in the air. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and then we, you know, um, we got quickly got to know each other. So we mm. met in 2012 and within 2014, we got married. Um, we just celebrated our 10 year wedding anniversary. Wow, congratulations, man. Cheers, man. Mm. And um, I'm not going to lie. Like, um, I didn't realize how my gambling was affecting her. Mm. And the truth here was, is that I think my life's caught up with her because she was asking me at a point where, well, you're looking after the money. Like, why are we not What's going, going out? on? Yeah. What, what, what <clears throat> not booking holidays? And then there'll be the little excuses. Oh, damn, I'm going to be meeting up with friends and there's money and I've just gambled that money away. Mm. Oh, you know, we're meeting up with these friends. We can't meet them because I've got work to do and, I, and mm. I've got it. That's priority. So if I knew I was meeting up with people or we're going out or we had to book a holiday or Valentine's, birthdays, Christmas, I was like, damn, I, I had no money to, to even to pray for the presence or stuff like that. So what happened was because I hit this from everyone, everything came to head on the 16th of June, 2020. What happened then? One, we've gone into a pandemic. So I remember this day vividly because it was about eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, and do you remember the weather we had back in, in that first pandemic, like 2020? It was baking. It was hot. 
Oh, I think it was those reports that it had been the hottest summer of, of the of in, a, of in, yeah, in 20, next, since the seventies or something yeah, like so that. It yeah, so it started to yeah, twenty, yeah. and then twenty one even got yeah, hotter, right? Yeah, yeah. So in twenty twenty, um, sixteenth June, it was about eight o'clock in the morning. The sun was beaming in. I can hear my two year old playing in his room, um, and I could, you know, I'm a coffee person because I can smell coffee. And I'm walking through, and I remember getting into my bedroom, and there's my wife, and she was bawling out, and I was like. As a man, as a husband, you go, first thing you ask yourself is, what's wrong? Yeah. And I asked her, what's wrong? But that quickly changed because I noticed there was a phone in her hand. And it was my phone. But you've seen all your apps. Well, here's <clears throat> the truth. It no longer became about what was wrong with her. It was about, damn, what she found out. Now, my back's up against mm. the wall. What she found out that I've lied to her about? Has she found out about the gambling? Has she found out about other things? So... 101 questions are going into my head and I don't care about her, her thoughts and her feelings right now, which is harsh to say, but it's the truth. Yeah. Cause you're trying to hide a shame in it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I remember when she looked at me, bro, it was these eyes of disappointment. Yeah. And I've never felt that before. And then she turned the phone around and everything was there black and white. Like I've got a screenshot I'll show you, mm. um, which shows you transactions after transactions after transactions. Do you mind if I show you? Yeah, quick? of course, man. Of course. Um, and when I, when I, when you look at this, I want you to look into the camera as well and just sort of tell people what what's going through your head when you're seeing this. Now, I want you just to take a couple of scrolls. That's one. Have a couple of scrolls. This way or that right. way? Go towards the right. In one day. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. You never took no days off. Keep going. That was just a glimpse. Are these other other gambling apps as well? No, so they were like okay. little things. normal transactions. Yeah, yeah, normal transactions. So for those of you who can't see what I just saw. This was a betting company and it's um, online app transactions of £1,000, £500, £500, £500, £300, £1,000, £100, £200, £500, but literally loads of them. Loads of them. Yeah. Bro, no wonder your wife was... That's a lot of money that could go into the, into the, the family home. Everything. Yeah. Like, you... So... And the reason I wanted to show that is so you get to understand that's what a gambler could look like. Mm. That's the reality of it. And, and when I had to face this, now this is the time I've now had to face the truth. Mm. And part of me was going to lie. And I thought to myself, do you know what, maybe this is uh, an option for me just to, because in the Bible, right? Um, they say, speak your truth and set you free. Mm. And I spoke my truth. I told her I've been gambling since 20, 2009. I've been gambling for so long. I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this. And I felt a sense of relief. But quickly came in the guilt. Mm -hmm. Because I was flooded with so much guilt. Because I've broken the fundamental thing that all relations are built upon. Which trust, is trust. Trust. Yeah. How could she trust me? And I remember, I remember that time, which was, because at the time we, you know, we were, we were living with our in-laws because we got now in the pandemic, we basically yeah. self-isolated with our in-laws yeah. as well. So um, I remember she ran downstairs and was like, pretty much pack your bags, you're gone, right? That's how I felt. So she ran downstairs to her dad and she was talking to her dad mm. and her mum was praying in the other room. And I remember thinking to myself, how have I got here, man? Like my this person has been through thick and thin with me. She's had my back. She's also held, you know these times where I've, borrowed from people and yeah. I'm trying to, and then your friends are arguing with you and she had my back against my friends against my brothers against my family but yet I've destroyed the mm. very person that held me and um I'm not gonna lie to you man as a man I felt I felt little yeah and um I put myself there I was I was I put myself in a place of blame to put myself there and um I remember packing my bags thinking listen this is the end of the road man like I've got a two-year-old and we also found out that we've got another child that's going to be born in 21. So she's pregnant with our second child and all the stresses that she's going to take on. I remember that day 
just I packed my bag and I remember just sitting in the room doing nothing. And then she came up and brought Jeevan to me and I'm playing around with him. <coughs> then she took him down and then she came up. So this about eight o'clock in the morning. Now I must have got bad to about three, four o'clock in the afternoon. She's come back up and she goes, I spoke to my dad. And I've spoken to your mum. The conversation with your mum was not pleasant. But I spoke to my dad and he said this. Put the addiction to one side. Hyde has a disease. He needs help. Mm. Apart from that, he's a good guy. Mm. So let's help him. Well, you know, you've got to thank God that your father-in-law had... You have a good relationship with your father-in-law. One of the best. You've got to thank God your relationship was there because most men would have seen that as an opportunity to get rid of you. 100%. Yeah. And and as a father for her daughter, mm. she should be like, now nah. he'd be like, no, go man. Like, yeah, don't he can't look after you financially. Yeah, yeah. Look what he's done. Mm. And and that's and that was one of the biggest fears, mm. because within the Ghanaian community or the Sikh community or Asian yeah. communities, there's this thing that our parents say, don't do anything bad because what are people going to say about the us? family name? Yeah, hundred <clears> percent. <throat> we will say that uh, in our in our language. We say Loki King which means what would other people say? Okay. Um, and it was that shame. So if mm. you bring shame on the family, then we're going to basically get you rid. We, yeah. we don't want you. Yeah. And for some religions, you bring shame on the family, it could go another route. Yeah, it can go down some very disastrous routes. Yeah. yeah, to the point where you no longer hear yeah. that routes. Yeah. So, and there's there was all these things. So my wife said to me, and I remember this, she said, if I'm going to work with you on our marriage, yeah. you are going to need to get professional help. Bro, man, I remember that day. And here's the reason why I remember that day is because as a human being, I was always being a people pleaser. Mm. I give so much to other people. I'm the life and soul of the party. I, I'm happy to give everything to people to protect who I am, my hidden demons, my hidden secrets. So I'm a very given person. But the one person I wasn't giving anything back to was the one person that helped me through everything. So I was using and abusing my mm. wife. Emotionally, financially, mm. um, I've never been physically abusive to her, but for some, some people are. Yeah, uh, and we saw that in the pandemic, right? Yeah. So, I've been given a lifeline. So I'm going to make this work, but then who do I ask for help, my man? Mm. Do I ask my parents? Do I ask my friends? Do I ask my brothers? To a certain element, I almost did, but then, what are they going to say about me? Yeah. The shame and guilt kicks in even more. Then I remember reaching out to my local temple. Bro, I, I came off that call with that local temple and I felt more judged than I've ever done before. I can imagine. Because, and I, I'm going to say this as it is, because you know I don't mix my words. In the Sikh community, we are very, as a community, we're happy to help other, other Christian faces, Muslim faces, Hindu like, seen faiths. I've during the lockdown, we're, I remember, yeah, yeah. As a community, we help every single person. But when it comes to our own, there's a black mark on that. Mm. Well, why do we want to help you when you're bringing a ba you're shedding bad light on our community? Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen that happen. And I might get a lot of crap for that by saying this, but you know what? I'd rather say the truth of it because if that can open up a different conversation, then why not? Mm. And the truth is, so if I've been told a place where you can go to, to open up about your problem because God is with you, now I've been told that you're judged by God, that you are a bad person, then how am I going to get the healing I need? I well, remember. It's not, just, it's not just a Sikh community. Prior to Islam, I was a Christian. It's the mm. same in the Christian community. You know, Christians can be very judgmental to other Christians, and especially because they're different sects of Christianity as mm. well. It's the same in Islam. I'm a Muslim. It's the same thing. Some Muslims look at you like you're bringing shame to Islam. Some don't want to help you. They pretend as if, oh yeah, I pray five times a day. But the truth is, you being a pickle, they'll start gossiping. They'll treat you. They'll make you even go spiral deeper into it because of the judgmental and the shame. I think, in honesty, I think I don't know about other religions, but I think all religions in general are so busy trying to please other people that they mm. think that's part of pleasing God. Wow. Do you see what I mean? So rather than thinking, oh, you know what, Hajj might need some help, but the community will judge me for helping Hajj. And if they judge me for helping Hajj, they won't think that I'm serious about my religion. But I really am serious about my religion. God knows. Let me prove it to you. I'm going to ostracize him as well. You know? But I think, I, I don't blame them because I think it's not the religion, it's the people. 
There you, you know are. what I mean? I can never yeah. blame religion because to me, I think all religions have truth in them. Yeah. You pick what makes sense to you. That's why I never judge other religions because yeah, yeah. what makes sense to me makes sense to me or makes sense to the next person. Like one man's a truck driver, next man's a bus driver. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, they chose what kind of vehicle they want to drive yeah. because it feels comfortable for them, innit? Yeah. And I look at religion the same way, but I can say every religious person I've met, no matter which religion I've met, I've met Nepalese people who are Hindus, Nepalese people who are Muslims. I've met Arabs. I've yeah. met Indians. I've met everyone from different religions all around the world. I've even met, what's that religion where they worship the fire in Iran? Oh, I can't remember. Not, not Sunnis, is it? No, no. R- R- is it R- Z- Zoroast- Z- Zoroasterism? Okay. Z- they worship, it's the oldest, apparently it's older than <clears throat> most religions, yeah, in the Persian and Middle Eastern region. And they worship a fire and their God is called Mazda. Okay. And um they influenced the the Babylonian and they influenced the um the uh, Mesopotamians and all those religions in, in history. And I've met one guy from that religion ever in my life and he said the same thing. And you know, like I think i I think you hit the nail on the head there, is that no matter what place of faith you're from, what place of worship you're from, um some of us don't believe in God. Some of mm. us believe in the universe or spirit or wh- whatever you want to call it. But for me, I found my way back to yeah. my faith and, wonderful, and my, wonderful. And my That's good. well-being mm. and God. But you're right. Because we live in we live in a man-made, ego-fueled society, mm. let's, let's look at what's happening around us. Yeah, yeah. With the wars, yeah. with inflation, that's that's government. <laughs> that's, all, that's all human. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that wasn't God. That's all human-based mm. people that are fueled by ego and greed. And what does the Bible, what does the Quran, the what is the, all the, of it? Yeah, the you know, the Guru Granth Sahib, what does that all teach you? What's the what's the book for the Sikhs? Guru Granth Sahib. Guru Guru Granth Sahib. Guru Granth Sahib. Yep. Guru Granth Sahib. So, I see. So Guru Granth Sahib is the eleventh Guru. I see. Because uh, after Guru Gobind Singh Ji, which was the tenth Guru, yeah, he said, after this Guru, we don't we don't believe there's anyone else. Yeah, because he got he got assassinated, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he did. And on his deathbed, he said, "Look, no more human, no more human, um, yeah, no more human gurus." all the teachings that you need from all the 10 past gurus are all in here. Yeah. And, and when you, and there's a difference, between, and here's a difference that I've found through my religion. There's one thing reading a religious book. And then there's one thing feeling the words of the religious yeah, book. Yeah. Two different things. Yeah. Now, when I read it, I'm trying to feel what the message is behind yeah, that. And, yeah. um, and I had to come through this. So coming out this journey, I realized that, well, hold on, I had to get help. So going back, mm. my faith didn't help me. So I went online and I just typed in help with gambling addiction. I remember NHS popped up. I just filled out a form for them. I remember Gamcare. Gamcare popped up. I remember the phone number. I called him and said, Gamcare, how can we help you? And I said, I've got a problem with gambling addiction. My wife just found out and I don't know what to do. And then I remember speaking to this lady on the, on the phone and I can't remember this conversation, but it must have been about half an hour, 40 minutes. And for pretty much most of that conversation, I was just crying. Wow. Because it's the first time I I thought, this person isn't here to judge me, isn't here to question me, only wants to help and have the best for me. Mm. And um, and that started my recovery. And um, part of the recovery process is, was that, do you know what? I remember doing the first session with my therapist, with Gamcare, and that was more of like, Here's what you, here's what yeah. you can do. Here's something called self exclusion. Here's what you need to do with your banks. But then, the process that we're going to go through is something called CBT. Mm. What is that? It's called cognitive behavioral therapy. Oh, okay. So NHS use it when they're doing the twelve steps or gambling addictions. Okay. Uh, and then Gam Care and all the therapists use it as well. And I remember the third session in, and I was excited because I found out certain parts of myself. And I go to, and I remember her name, Alison. And I was like, Alison, if you're watching this, I've been trying to get in touch with you. Alison from what's the name of the company again? Yeah. Gamcare. Gamcare. Yeah. Big up Alison from Gamcare, yeah. man. Because she genuinely saved my life. Mm. And um, and here's the reason why I felt that, damn, the world is against me. Because I remember reaching out to her. And then before we started that session, she said, Harj, I can't carry any more session with you because you you spoke to NHS and they're going to have to take over. Oh. And I remember in the NHS. So I'm now speaking to Alison. I can't do, we're doing one-on-one, but on Zoom because mm. of the pandemic. Mm. So now I've gone to NHS and the NHS now, I remember the first call, I was annoyed that Alison had to take her services from me, but she said, do NHS after 12 to 12 weeks, come back to me, we'll see where you're at. Oh, wow, okay. But she didn't stop me. She goes, come back to me and we'll see where you're at. 
I remember the first call was NHS. I jumped onto the Zoom call and it wasn't one on one. It was a group call. I'm thinking, how am I going to get better? And the truth was, I wasn't getting better. Mm. So from from June to August, I went further than the whole of darkness. And I remember there was a part of my life where things weren't going the way it was. I wasn't making money because I was trying to promise. Because remember, um, even throughout this whole process, I had to do one of the very hardest tasks, which is sit with my wife and work out all the finances. And when we worked out the finances, bro, oh, that was scary because we worked out that I was in £250,000 debt mm-hmm. because of my addiction. And as a man, as a provider, I need to make this right. And I started a business in the pandemic and it wasn't going right. I'm losing clients and I wasn't driving money in. And I remember I pinned my hopes onto this meeting to try and close this contract. It's a big contract. And I remember at the end of that meeting, they were like, Hard, we love what you've got to say, but we've got an existing client. We've got an existing provider. We're just going to speak to them first. And if they can't deliver, then we might come to you. And it was a kick in the bollocks, man, because mm-hmm. I put my heart and soul into that meeting. And that was 18th of August. And I remember that day so vividly because I stopped myself from going home because I was so ashamed of what was happening in my life. And I think the internal voices that were happening at that time was, you made a promise. You haven't delivered on your promise. You're a fucking failure. Your kids think you're a failure. Your kid to born thinks you're a failure. Wow. You're a failure. Like, how could you be a person that begged, borrowed, stole? All these thoughts were were so self-abusive to my own self-dialogue that I remember getting into my car from Nottingham and I'm driving on the M1. And I thought to myself, why am I even here? And I was I was so down that rabbit hole that it was, I found it hard to climb out of it and I didn't want the energy to climb out of it. So for me, it was easier to do one thing, which is to unbuckle my seatbelt Wow. third lane and I closed my eyes and I put my car into a central reserve and I wanted to be dead to be fair and I remember sort of waking up or was I awake or was I dead and I remember having this little internal conversation am I dead am I alive fuck am I alive I wanted to be dead and then the senses kicking the smell I remember the smell of smoke and I remember now I'm panicking. Now I'm realizing I'm alive, but I'm thinking, damn, I need to flee the scene. I tried starting my car and there's no way this car was going to start. I, I'm not sure if you've seen some of the pictures, but um, no. my car was wrecked. Mm-hmm. And um, the truth is I came out of that car without any broken bones, only a couple of scratches. The paramedics came on scene and she looked at me, looked at the car. And she said, Hard man, if you don't believe in a higher power, God, universe, spirit, you better start believing because people have been in accidents less than this and they haven't walked out. So you talk about divine intervention. Was this a divine intervention? And I still didn't believe it was. Maybe because of the shock, maybe because it hadn't sunk in. And it was two days after that, the 20th of August, things started getting overwhelmed in my because I think the reality of what I did. And I, I didn't tell my wife what I did. I just said I had a car accident. No other one was hurt. But the reason I didn't want to tell her because she was still pregnant with my second child. And I didn't want to bring more stress on her. And I didn't tell her until she had the child. But didn't they realize your car wasn't there anymore? No, no. She she knew the car was in an accident. Okay. But I didn't tell her I tried to take... Intentionally, yeah, I see. Well, using the language, mm. I tried to unalive myself. Yeah. And um, I didn't tell her that. What I did, what I did say to her, I was in a situation. I put myself in a situation. I just, I've messed up. Uh, I've been in an accident. No one's hurt. It's myself. It was a bit raining. I used that as an excuse. Yeah. The car went out of control. Up, yeah. And um, and it was my son Jeevan, and in his name Jeevan means life or bringer of life. Okay. In in Punjabi, and um, he saved my life, man. Because one thing that he taught me was the true value of dependency what i mean by that is as a man i had two children now if i've checked out from this place i haven't given them what they need Mm. and i'm not talking about generational wealth yeah no the houses the rolex watches the cars the the lifestyle the money that doesn't mean shit yeah 
true generational wealth is what you leave within them that carries through the next generations. Yeah. Um, so I made a promise to myself that day and it was because of a McDonald's chip and what he gave me, the words he said to me changed everything in my life. And I remember going back to NHS, doing what I need to do. And I went back to GAM care and I said, Alison, I'm ready. And I'm, I'm ready because I'm, I've made a promise to myself and she helped me through something and she realized my patterns and why I was doing certain things. And she went beyond CBT and did something called inner child work. Oh, wow. And therapy. She, yeah. So, and, and this is why therapy is so important because we tell ourselves, so for an example, when we, when we have a problem, we tell ourselves a story internally that would validate that problem. Mm. So then we think it's okay to be in that problem. But when we have a therapist or someone that can call us out on our bullshit or that someone can give you a different perspective on it, she shared with me certain things of why I did certain things and why as a seven, eight-year-old child, that gave me a different perspective of life. I'm not blaming my parents for what they did. I'm not blaming my brothers for who they are. I'm not blaming my life for what it gave me. I'm thanking my life for what it's given me. <sighs> and because of that and the need for significance, validation, worth lack of love those are the reasons i was going to gambling to fill that void i see and no matter what because i was on a hundred thousand pound job that's a lot that's a lot of money man. a lot of money for people yeah. right but it still was enough because i hadn't validated my true self my inner mm. worth to be validated i'm enough that's deep man so through this whole process i realized that um i'm only doing what i call maharaj's hookum which means God's will, God's doing. Okay. And I'm doing this thing that we're taught in the Sikhi, which is seva, which is to selflessly give without anything in return. Mm. This is why you see the Sikh community doing like the longer, they go out onto the, the homeless, they do um, uh, open kitchens, they do a lot of service. That's called seva. Mm. So my seva to mankind and humanity right now is helping people through their addictions. So I made a I made a massive choice at the beginning of this year to not focus on my career but focus on my calling. And that calling is there are many other people from the South Asian community. And the reason why I'm saying South Asian yeah. is because there's enough representation for the white community. Yeah. My um the charity that I work with, Red Card, you know, Tony Kelly, former professional football player, he's mm. a black Caribbean. He's now focused on the black community because it's mm. underrepresentation in that community. Because yeah. we we've seen it with the black Caribbean community where yeah. the elders are going into bookies because oh, they've had bro. that lifestyle. Oh man. Even just yesterday I was driving with my wife and we were in like a posh part of central London. You know those back streets you have to cut through sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And there's a bookie there and there was two black guys sat outside on there, you know those mobility yeah, scooters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were sat there smoking a cigarette and I'm sticking to myself. Damn, you guys shouldn't be here. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is central London. Like, they, but they've got to go there because they probably got a bad rep with their local bookie. <laughs> well, then that I beg, that I beg to ask the conversation of what is the council then doing to help these elderly? Well, let's yeah. let, let's look what look Keir Starmer's done recently. Mm. So there's been the local votes which now have allowed for it to be passed where they're going to be doing the winter cuts. That means four thousand elderly people in the UK won't receive the benefits to. I'm thinking about that because that's potentially 4,000 elderly people that's not going to get access to warmth mm. and that could potentially die. Yeah, yeah. That's our government. So if our government are failing them and they're not given a sense of community, they're only really going to go to a place where they can have a community feel and mm. bookmakers are great at this. They give the elderly a sense of community. They give teas, they give biscuits, they hook up with their homeboys and they can just chill there. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they're, they're addicts. My God, they're so smart, aren't they? Yeah hook you in but you know that leads this is a great segue because this leads to what com the conversation we had i think it was two days ago you said to me you were at the house of parliament yeah yesterday and what were you doing over there so i was advocating why there needs to be a ban on gambling ads okay and also how gambling advertising has changed from just static ads mm. not just to the 15 second 30 second ads to something so sinister right mm. now which is something i really want to talk to you about okay so what is it that you want to change because okay we understand the gambling ads but what how is how is the government involved in this what's the government got to do with this so the, the way it works you have something called the dcms which is department for culture media and sports okay right and and they take a lot of the levy. So they look at where that money's going and they and they also have a massive um, 
massive decision making for that for that industry. Now, the UK government receives 3.5 billion in tax receipts from the betting revenues, right? And the betting revenues for UK betting operators is 15.1 billion. Okay. So that's 15 billion that's been lost by individuals gambling. Mm. So that means that if the government don't get that three and a half billion, what's that going to do to the GDP of the country? Mm. What's that thing going to do to the government? And of that three and a half, three and a half billion, only approximately hundred million goes to prevention. It goes to awareness, <laughs> prevention, treatment, and research. Mm. So my thing is here is, is that the gambling commission and the ASA. So the ASA is the authority for um, the advertising standards authority. And you've got the gambling commission. Now, what people don't realize is that they are self-regulatory bodies, which means they are self-governing. Who's going to govern them? Well, they don't. They govern themselves, mm. which also means that the ASA are funded by who? The companies that pay them the advertising yeah. money. The Gambling Commission is, is funded by who? The betting operators that give them billions, if not hundreds of millions, to fund them. And you know why I believe what you're saying? Yeah. Because gambling, gambling is one addiction. Then you've got the drugs. Then you've got the alcohol. Oh, of course. Right? Now, one thing I know, shout out to The Wire. Those of you who seen The Wire. Oh, man. What? <laughs> Bro. <laughs> Bunk. <laughs> I tried to get my wife into The Wire, but she's oh, just man. not understanding why I wanted to watch it. When you watch The Wire and you hear like some of the rappers like Tupac who used to talk about this stuff and expose this stuff, you realize how it's a dirty political game. Yeah. They know the amount of money that's being made of gambling addiction, the amount of money that's been made of the drug dealers and the drug addicts. Mm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Say, they know the amount of money that's been made of the ports for the drugs to be coming. It's a whole, it's like a, it's like a, it's like an octopus with so many tentacles. Yeah. It is, there's money from all these tentacles and they don't want that machine to stop. They don't. They don't. And, and, and the way, and look at it from this perspective. So there's a difference between permitting gambling and promoting gambling now i'm not here to stop people from gambling mm. that's the permitting side yeah so look dude if you want to gamble because you treat it as a sport and you have fun with it great i'm not there's a permitting stuff mm. go and do it man mm. but when when you are leveraging um or you're taking advantage of loopholes in the legal system so for an example um there's a big company from um uh from ireland they're also known as uh, PD. PD. PP. PP. <laughs> PP. Um, mm. So in their adverts, they shouldn't be really using the pound sign because they're going against um, the Irish legislation. So they should only be using euros, mm. but they're using pound signs. So if, they, if they're saying, well, we're against, we're using the Irish legislations that governed here, well, then why are you using pounds when that's a UK legislation mm. so there are and there are things that need to be said things that need to be done but then we're seeing the promotions on online um which are then also opened up to that's dangerous children yeah that's very dangerous i'm gonna come yeah. on to that as well because this is something very dangerous mm. we're also seeing um influencers celebrities Drake, were, were you were you, were you the one telling me about Drake and, and, and we're talking to DM? Yeah. He told me Drake has got something and I went to his page. It's true. It's, it, it's He makes it look so nice. It looks so interesting. I didn't even know it was gambling. I thought it was part of his old fashion. Yeah, yeah. What's it called? Um, steaks or... Steak. Steak or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It looks so nice. I thought it was just... But he's actually a gambling company. His own gambling... Is it his own company? So what happened was is he came on to... He saw the world of streaming, which is something else. Mm. And then he realised, hold on. Um, so... According to reports, he gambled about a billion dollars with stake. And then I think he was like, well, hold on. If I'm betting a billion and he's seeing how lucrative this industry is, the uh, one of the co-founders, an Australian guy, bought a Drake on as first, I think it was an ambassador, but mm. now I think a business partner. Jeez. So it's kind of like Ciroc, but a gambling Ciroc. Of course. <laughs> but, but let me touch on that, mm. right? Because um, the rule that you saw, and that's why we, we're here today. There is a streamer, I'm not going to say their name, but they have, they have on the stream, whether it's Twitch or um, what's the other one? I Kick. don't know. Yeah, okay. Kick. And there's the all reports between stake owning Kick and stuff like that. But mm. let's use Twitch and these streaming websites. Now, this individual was on a streaming website 
and he was making a suggestion to a 12 year old and there's another one to a 15 year old which says should i start gambling and this is a 12 year old I saw that on your page yeah yeah and that's like the 12 year old was like i'm 12 years old should i should i start gambling and the message behind that was look 12 years old you should be gambling since you were born because this person is trying to teach people on how to build generational wealth through gambling but why is it whether it's Drake, whether these influencers whether these streamers they're only ever showing their wins and never their yeah, downfalls losses. yeah yeah because if they show their downfalls then they're never going to get the people to buy into it yeah and i looked at this even further so when i looked at the average user demographic on twitch it started at 16 years old. So 16 to 24, I believe is 25 to 20 something percent, which is the second largest. Then after that, it's the next demographic, which I think is 25 to 30 something, 25 to something, 30, oh which is about 30%. However, the one thing they did not report on is that you can start um, streaming on kick at the age of 13. So where's all the data between the 13 to 16 year olds? But also... Gambling is illegal between, uh, depending on different countries, but yeah. here it's under 18, right? Mm. I think in America it's under 21 or whatever it is. So where's the legislation about that? Mm. Where's the reports around that? And here's what I'm going to say, and and I'm going to call it for what it is. Have you ever seen Oliver Twist? A movie? A movie. Yeah. And you, Oliver is part of a group of, thieves. of, of begging thieves. Yeah. yeah. But then who is the person that they look up to? Who's the, the puppet master? Yeah. Berg. Yeah. Remember Ferg, the, yeah. the man? The old man, yeah. And he and he was almost like, you got to do this. Yeah. And if you don't do this, and he comes out and said, please, sir, more. Mm. Well, he goes, no, you got to go and get more. Yeah. But then they go out onto the streets and they and they start stealing from the common person. Yeah. Now, that's very much like the betting industry. In what sense? So if the betting industry is like Ferg, these betting operators, mm. and they're using influencers like the Oliver Twists, mm to go and loot from the common person. Yeah. That then gives them, so for an example, Stake, one of the biggest crypto casinos, and not just them, there's other ones like Rubet and other companies. They are paying influencers. Aiden Ross said this on an interview. Aiden Ross is a big streamer and he goes into, he does a lot of gambling streams. He is paid, so he said he was offered, I think, 108 million from Kick. I think it was 80 million or 108 million from Kick as a sponsor. He turned that down because he realized that it's more lucrative to charge him per the hour. So if, when he streams on the hour, they ask him how much you paid. He goes, is it in the six figures per hour? He's like, no, it's in the fives. So even if he's paid minimum mm. 10,000 an hour, mm. that's a big amount of money. Mm. And if he's streaming for five hours, because these streamers can go on for a long time, right? Like look at Kai. There's all these other streamers like Trainwrecks TV. There's Nectar. There's Aiden. There's Exposed. Um, there's Drake. There's all these celebrities out here, right? But what they don't realize is that, look at the gambling history. Our parents were the first generations of the horse betting and stuff mm. like that. Now we're seeing more people. When I looked at the last reports, we're seeing 25 to 32 being the biggest gambling addiction people of demographics but now the industry is going that's not good enough we need to go further Jeez. and you know what it's funny because when these people sit down in their meetings and they sit down and they discuss these things every company's agenda is to make more mm. you know is to get a wider demographic increase their profits but sometimes it finds i find it difficult to believe that in these realms where families are being destroyed, um, marriages are being destroyed, people's lives are being ended, people are just destroying themselves in all, in all ways that they can. They don't consider that at all. It doesn't cross their mind at all. So when I was at the summit yesterday, we were talking about this and the Advertising Standards Association Authority said this, and also within cahoots of gambling, uh, the Gambling Commission, they said there's not enough causal effect that's linked to gambling adverts which causes harms mm. so i stood up and i said well you talk about that the evidence is there it costs the uk government approximately over a billion pounds a year and that goes to um death by suicide homelessness 
criminal activities, divorce, abuse, cross addictions, therapy. What is cross addictions? So what we talked about before. So people that have a uh, maybe a gambling addiction mm. also would have maybe addiction to drugs and alcohol. Oh, I see. So okay. Yeah. So here's the pain, mm. and here's to numb the pain. Mm. And um, and the truth is here is that we're seeing the ASA and the Gambling Commission tiptoeing around language. So for an example, they're saying we can't use the word problem gambler. We can't use the word gambling addict because that's, they're saying, oh, we can't use, we have to use something like gambler related harms. We can't even use the word disorders. So what they're doing, and like even social media, they're doing it. So you can't even- You said unalived earlier. Yeah. Unalived, yeah. We can't even use the S word. Mm. And whenever I used it, my videos get what? They get, they get shunned, yeah. they, get, yeah. they get broken down. So I have to change the language. Mm. And, and yesterday, Will said this perfectly. He said, call it for what it is. I'm gonna say it simply, which is gambling is the cause of harm, not the individual. I would say again, gambling is a cause of harm, not the individual. Mm. And the and even off the back of that, there was a guy there called Ravi Naik, and he works a lot with the legal systems. And they said that these gambling companies have not just a hundred, they have tens of thousands of data points on an individual that will tell them everything they need to know. So every time you go online or you're placing a bet, it looks at what your patterns are and it will it will change its behaviors based on your patterns so you're forever losing. Mm. Man, you know what's so funny, yeah? I I love rap music. Not as much as I used when I was younger, because the older I've gotten, I can see a lot of his flaws. But when I come across a conscious rapper or a positive rapper, I will support them. Yeah. But there was a time when I would even support gangster rappers or I'd even support any rapper, no matter what he was talking about, yeah. as long as he could put words together. It didn't matter what he was saying, but if his lyrical ability was amazing, I was more focused on that. Yeah. Now I'm more focused on, okay, you can be the greatest lyricist, but what are you saying? Mm. And the one thing I realized growing up now is that what you're saying, from the moment rap music became a lucrative business for investors, they use rap music for the exact same thing that you were talking about. Yeah. First of all, it was fashion. My ad. I'm not going to say the name. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah. Run DMC. Shout out to Run DMC. Yeah. And, um, you know, high fashion and brands. Yeah. You know, he went from wearing the FUBUs and the Karkanis to wearing. Oh, man. You yeah. know, all this stuff that co companies like before were suing rappers if they wore it because they're like, don't wear it in your music videos. You're, you know, you're destroying our clientele or our fan base. And I'm just looking at like alcohol as well. Like I mentioned Ciroc earlier. They use Puffy to sell alcohol, um, Ciroc. They use other rappers to sell other drinks like Hennessy. Who are these people's fan base? We know that it's not it's not people at my age buying these albums. Yeah. When I was buying, when 50 Cent came out, I think I was how old? 18 when 50 Cent came out? Yeah. I bought his album, an 18 year old. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. But prior to that, don't think I wasn't buying albums. But I had Nas's album, which is I Am. I bought that when I was in secondary school. So I must have been like 15 or 16. Who are these people selling these drinks to? Who are they selling these these ones that are now the influencers of today, they're like the rappers, the rap superstars of today. It's no longer musicians. These are influencer superstars, right? Yeah. Who are their fan base? Young children. So how are these lot allowed to gamble? How are rappers allowed to talk about Hennessy and Covossier and Tupac is talking about Alizé all the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who are his fan base? Yeah, well, yeah. It, and, and it's true because it, but we talk about that, right? <clears throat> let's look at celebrities, Drake, but let's look beyond that. Um, Football stars. Mm. Neymar. I posted a video of, of Neymar. I think his child turned two, one or two, three at the time. So while they're singing happy birthday while cutting his daughter's cake, he's you can see him playing poker stars. So he's not even looking at the child or looking at the cake. He's looking, singing it and, and playing poker stars. He was that addicted. Or a poker stars or whatever the poker game yeah. was. He was that addicted. So Neymar. So you got these football influencers look at football matches uh, i think 10 or 11 premier league clubs right now are sponsored on the shirts by betting operators you know the one that you you know when you when you made me scroll through your phone yeah the, that was bet bet yeah yeah they're on they're on i've seen them on some yeah. kind of like football I gear think, or something I, I believe they are west ham Yo, it's a dark world we live in, you know. But check this out. Let me take it even one step mm. further. So I was having a look at um, 
some of the big, big, big operators. Because for me, I need to I need to know the truth. Mm. And and the and the difference here is, and I'll come on to why why there's a difference between people that want to go after the truth and why some people don't. Mm. Because there's something that says I can or I won't. Okay, break it down. What I mean by that is is what are you willing to risk to get to the truth? Mm. If it costs you your life, are you willing to go to the truth? Mm. Some people are, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I won't do that. Yeah. I'm saying I can do that because I choose to do it because I've, I've danced on death's doorstep. Mm. And my wife knows where I'm going with this. Mm. And if, I'm, if that means me getting to the truth and uncovering certain things, then I'm going to call it for what it is. So there are a, a cluster of, of big operators that are managed by one organization. Um, so about the food industry. Well, I'm going to talk. So the comp- this one individual company is called Flutter, right? You can look at who who they who they are done. So th- and they're changing it. They're not only just calling themselves gambling; they they're calling themselves gaming and eye gaming companies because they're using oh we're using a lot of gaming and experiences. Uh. But when I then said, well, hold on, who are the shareholders behind this organization? So I looked at the top ten, three that stood out. Can you do you want, do you know one of them? Well, one of them is Vanguard. Isn't Vanguard like BlackRock? So the the two organizations that pretty much control the world um, are Vanguard and BlackRock, which then goes to another pillar on top of that. I won't get in there, but if you look at, I'll come on to that as well because if now we're getting to a cashless society, there's a reason for that. And Tesco's the two biggest shareholders are BlackRock and Vanguard. Tesco. Tesco. So when I looked at this organization, Flutter, Vanguard, I think, were the third or fourth large, fourth or fifth largest. But then what really shocked me was the other two, Barclays Bank and Santander. Not surprised. Why are banks? Not surprised. Yeah, why, yeah, but, but why are banks? <laughs> Taking your money yeah. to make money by yeah. sponsoring people. Yeah. So then when they say, oh, banks should intervene, banks are, well, we don't want to intervene because mm. then we're, 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 we're protecting our shareholders. We're protecting our assets. Once again, it all becomes about profit before people. Mm. Governments, establishments, organizations, human beings, greed, ego, profits before humanity. Mm. It's yeah. always been that way, man. It's always been. That's why we've seen that way, wars. Yeah. That's why we've seen um, c- colonial takeovers and stuff like that. It's because of people's ego and greed. Yeah, of course. I mean, look, this country is called Britain. It's named after Britannia. When the ancient Romans came here and they conquered this island, they called it Britannia. Yeah. And that's only because their goddess Britannia was the queen, was like the goddess of the waves. And because they had a rough ride here, they thanked Britannia for giving them a ride here. And for, yeah, you know what? Because we got a smooth ride here due to Britannia. Let's, let's name this island Britannia. Yeah. And they've literally pumped everything into this island. Like yeah. a lot of people don't realize this island was once a colony of slaves and colonized people who eventually got their freedom and went and done to others what was done to them. Exactly. It's just the, it's just how it goes, man. And and even even with that, and when you're talking about colonialism, and then we look at what's happened with the country in itself. So if we if we look at the industry, and the reason why I'm doing this is because in order for me to understand why I was an addict, I need to go to the source of what are what's happening. Now I've I've heard of cases where one individual case where somebody unalived themselves and they received 18 emails after their, their them passing to say, you got a free bet or we've missed you. Like, Sorry, that's wrong. I shouldn't be laughing. But I find it funny. Because once again, it's a case of mm. they the, the, the betting industry is, and, and, I, and I remember watching a clip and speaking to a senior technical person and he said this, he said, there's something called the VIPs and the VIPs are not who you think they are. So if I said to you, who would you class as the VIP in, in an online casino? I don't know, the people who are probably the biggest addicts? Exactly. Mm. And they're not the one with the biggest pockets. Jeez, but they spend the most because like, they're always continuously, consistently bringing in. Look at bookmakers. Why are bookmakers situated in deprivated areas? You know, my wife said the same thing yesterday, you know. I'm from, I'm from Slough. Mm. Slough has, I think, about 30 to 40 bookies. But then I look at this neighbouring town, Windsor. Windsor only has three. 
So, yeah. so what I'm saying to you is that there's a reason that their bookies are in deprivated areas. And even if you look at like, you know, I'm doing a lot of stuff with councils. Mm. With, so my aim is if I can create more education and awareness, that's one aspect. However, what needs to happen right now is there needs to be more people getting help. That's why I share my story so openly. So when people hear this or people see my posts since the beginning of this year, mm. Drazi, as much as all the work I'm doing in parliament, trying to make a law changes, sharing my story, being, and I've, I've spoken on BBC, House of Lords, House of Commons, all these great things, even challenge Sadiq Khan. Now that sounds great, but the biggest wins or what drives my purpose is that since the start of this year, um, I've nearly helped 100 people start their recovery journey. Wow. And I've stopped nine people from either the thought or the intent of... Unaliving. Unaliving. Well done, man. Well done, bro. And that's my purpose. Mm. So when everyone says to me, what's your purpose in life? I don't know what my purpose in life is. I'm fortunate enough to know what my purpose in life is. And that means how do I change at a humanitarian level mm. by sharing my story, getting people help. And I don't charge anyone for mm. help. Yeah. Because... I will go to the people that are causing the problems in the first place. Yeah. So for me, whenever I do therapy sessions or help you out to get CBT, mm. it's awfully funded because I don't want that burden to be on the person that's going through the problem. Oh, that's dope. So where can people find you? If someone's watching this right now and they want your services or they need help, they're spiraling, where can they find you? So one of the easiest places that you can reach out to me is on any other social platforms like Instagram or TikTok. Harj Gale. Harj Gale, you want to spell it out? Yes, H A R J G A H L E Y. G A H L E Y. Or if you want to and you want to reach out to me personally, I've got a charity which I'm the director of, which is Red Card Gambling Support, the CIC. And you can email me, which is Harj, H A R J, at Red Card Gambling, R E D C I R D, gambling.org. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, just before we wrap it up, I want to ask you one question. The confidence you have to tell your story. What is it like for you? Because we mentioned earlier about communities and how sometimes you expect them to support you, but sometimes it's communities outside that will show you the more support. How Have you received any backlash, any death threats, pardon me, unalive threats mm -hmm. from your community for being so honest about something that usually your community would not want someone from your community exposing. Yeah. And I said that straight away because that's what it has been. So I've had, yeah, so all of those, all of the above. But I've realized that at first it used to get to me. Mm. But then this thing called resilience. When you, when you find out what your purpose is, and I always say this to myself, you can't experience happiness without sadness. Positivity without negativity, mm. love without hate. And I need the yin yang effect because not only does it fuel me, mm. like yesterday I posted about the S prevention day, mm. right? And I posted a really prominent video, which which was basically saying, you have people around you and the World Health, World, uh, World Health Organization said there are approximately 720,000 cases per year across the globe. To give you context, man, that's 1,900 per day. That's 82 per hour mm. right and when it comes to gambling in the uk there are approximately 400 to 650 per year just because of gambling thousand or just 600 no, just, uh, 400 to 650 only okay per year that are linked to gambling that shows you the problem how pertinent mm. it is so what i'm trying to say here is that we all have a voice and that voice can be the voice of change. Mm. And yesterday I posted and this person said something really rude in my language. Mm. And the way I respond to that is you're always with the words of encouragement mm. because I use that as my fuel to go and help my purpose even more. Cause they're more concerned with what you're doing to the community than what you're actually doing to save lives. Yeah. And the thing that you ask yourself is, is that a them problem or is that a me problem? Mm. That's a them problem. Yeah. And I always say to them, if you ever need support or help or advice, I'm here for you. Because not only do you kill them with kindness, mm. but you know the coffin with love. Mm. I like that. I like that. Oh, it's just been a very interesting conversation. 
Well, thank you very much for coming. And do you want to shout out your contacts once again? Where people can contact you once again? Yeah, so if you want to reach out to me on any one of my platforms, just look for Harj Gale, H-A-R-J-G-A-H-L-E-Y. Or you could go to redcardgambling.org or you could email me personally, which is Harj at redcardgambling.org. All right. Guys, you heard it from Mr. Harj himself. Any of you who feel as if you might need these services, don't be shy. And um, you mentioned earlier, what was the lady and the company that saved that? She get, she helped you? Yeah, so Gamcare. So Gamcare. there's Alison Whitfield from Gamcare. But once again, part of what I do is I will get them access to free support. Okay, I see. So, so the way okay. it works is that I would help them through. All right. And then now if I if I can't support them individually, then I've got a cluster of organizations right. that can okay, help them. Okay, that's dope. And the reason why I want this to be more pertinent from the black community and from the South Asian community because there are people suffering in silence yeah, yeah. and your voice is not forgotten. And hopefully my story inspires your voice to be heard. You heard it there guys. So guys, please make sure you share this video. Make sure if you find some inspiration from it as well, that you go and seek help and just make sure that if anyone needs to watch this, you send that to them as well. It's been a very interesting conversation. Hard. I really appreciate you coming. And um, yeah, guys, thanks for watching the Drazzy show, man. Peace.